Are you ready to get into the scriptures? Okay, so let's do this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Now, this is going to be the primary passage of scripture that we're going to look at. We're going to refer to a couple of others, but folks, this will be our prim primary verse. So uh, this is kind of the, the, the meat of it for us. If you don't have your Bible with you, this verse, as well as the others, will be on the screen. But here's what, here's what we're doing. We're finishing up from last week's message. So if you were not here last week, we uh, received communion after the message. But we actually talked about communion. And the passage of scripture that we looked at last week was 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now in this particular passage, Paul the Apostle is bringing some instruction and encouragement and even correction to the church at Corinth. Uh, this is a church that was pretty immature. They loved the Lord with all of their hearts, and they, they loved God, but they were immature. And part of their immaturity was that they weren't getting along with each other. And so there were this, a lot of division and factions and for, unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment towards each other and all of this stuff. And some of that some of those issues were showing up during communion. Now, communion for them was a meal that lasted for hours. Now, a lot of their meals back in the Jewish culture lasted for a long time because it was a time to connect. There was a lot of uh, significance to every meal. But the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, this type of meal, communion, even had more significance. It was meant to remind ourselves of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. His suffering and the spilling of His blood, the brokenness of His body and the spilling of His blood. And so that's unlike any other meal. And so what Paul was uh, uh, correcting really with the Corinth church is that they had taken the Lord's Supper or communion and they had caused it to become just a common meal. So what was happening is because they weren't getting along with each other, they weren't looking out for one another. And so some folks were eating more food than they should because others weren't getting anything to eat. And then others were drinking more wine than they should because Paul said, y'all are getting drunk during communion. Now, he didn't say it like that, but that's what he said. What have you lost your mind? Do you guys, have you forgotten? This is my paraphrase, and it's pretty accurate. You take it right from the Greek language. Paul says, well, have you guys lost your minds? Do you not, have you forgotten what this meal is all about? This is not about you guys just getting together and having fun. This is not about you just satisfying hunger pains. This meal is sacred. It's meant to announce the death and burial of Jesus until he returns again. It's incredibly sacred. You guys have caused it to become common and primarily that's because y'all aren't getting along with each other. You've got these walls of division. So there's two elements to communion. There is the bread and there is the cup or the wine. The bread, Jesus says, represents his body. The wine represents his blood. Last week we focused primarily on the bread, the, bro the body of Jesus. And Jesus said about this bread, when you eat this bread, this bread represents my body which is broken or will be broken for you, and which was broken for you. So the bread represents the brokenness of Christ's body. What he's referring to is the beating that he would experience. He's referring to the lashes on his back that he would receive. So what we, what we saw and discovered last week is that in the book of Deuteronomy, when there was a conflict between one man and another, when there was a wall of division, a dispute between one man and another man, the judge would determine who was the guilty one and who was the innocent one, who was the offender and who was the one offended. And the way that dispute would be settled and that wall of conflict would come down and all that would be done, done away with is that uh, depending on the severity of the crime, the one that was the wrong one, the guilty one, would receive lashes on his back not to exceed 40. So many times it was 39. And so once that happened, then that dispute between those two men were settled. So the judge would say, look, the guilty guy, you received, let's say, 39 lashes. You don't need to go another day feeling guilty about what you've done. You've paid for your offense. It's over. And then to the guy that was offended, the judge would say, you need to let it go. He took 39 lashes. You all need to hug it out now. You guys need to forget about it. You guys need to move on, and you need to realize, take the wall down. Does this make sense, everybody? So when Jesus took the lashes on his back, what was happening? Two things. One, there was a wall that was between us and God, and it was our sin that created that wall. There was a, and as a result of our sin, we were in conflict with God. 
Because of that sin, there was a dispute that needed to be settled between us and God. Sin had to be settled and be paid for. The punishment had to, for sin had to be paid. Does this make sense? Had to be paid for. So when Jesus took those lashes on his back, when his body was broken, it was to bring reconciliation and settle the dispute between God and man. So God says, look, Jesus took those stripes on his back. Your sin's paid for. That wall's been brought down. We've been reconciled now to God. But the other thing that that represents is that that means also that there's no wall of division between us as believers and as men and women, whatever, or man and man, or woman and woman, whatever conflict, whatever dispute, listen folks, Jesus, it's already been settled through the brokenness of His body. Well, what about the wounds that I've experienced because of the betrayal of someone else or the sin of someone else or that I've been abused physically, verbally, sexually, whatever the offense might be, no matter how deep that wound goes, Jesus said, this bread represents my body which is broken for you. The wounds I took on my back went deep enough to bring healing to the wounds you've experienced because you've been wronged by somebody else. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to let the wounds of the past by others define you or shape the, your life. Does this make sense, everybody? So J Jesus is saying, remind yourself of this healing that's there. He was also saying that when we receive communion, and Paul was saying, look, when you guys receive communion, this is the perfect opportunity to forgive. Because you've been forgiven, it's a perfect opportunity to let it go and forgive and let that wall of offense or unforgiveness come down, right? See, Jesus' flesh was parted and split open so that the offenses that cause us to be parted from each other and separated from each other and split, we, that there could be healing and we're brought back together again as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now that's really good right there. Amen? Does that make sense, everybody? So that's what we talked about last week, so now you don't have to go to the website and watch it or listen to it. And so the second element is the cup, which represents the blood of Jesus. So that's what we're going to talk about today, and that brings us to Hebrews 9. So here's what the writer of Hebrews says. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? So the, Hebrews, the writer here, this verse here is telling us something very powerful about the blood of Jesus, this cup. Because when we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, I want you to be mindful and reminded of the significance of, the, of my bro broken body. And I want you to be reminded of the significance of my shed blood. What does the shedding of his blood accomplish? What does it do? What's the power in it? Why is it so sacred? All of those things. We, every time we receive communion, we need to be, it reminds us of, of that. Does that make sense? And so Hebrews 9, verse 14, there's several things in here that, that's why we're going to kind of take a few moments and break this down. Now, let me give you a little background here because we're kind of jumping into a, a line of thought here in, in Hebrews. So in verse 14, it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ? What's happening before that verse? The writer in the, in the, in the, in the passage of Scripture is describing to us the power of, that was in the blood of the animals under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. So the way they worship God, I think we've talked about this before, but let me just remind you. So God says, look, if, you, if you're going to worship me, here's what needs to happen. There's got to be blood involved. There's got to be blood involved every time. So remember Cain and Abel, they were worshiping God. God rejected Cain's, and we've talked about this before, God rejected Cain's offering, but he accepted Abel's. What was the difference? Cain was bringing the first fruits of his land. Abel was bringing the first fruits of his flock. Cain's Abel, God rejected. Abel's offering, God accepted. And the reason why is because Abel's offering involved the shedding of blood. Cain's offering was bloodless, so God rejected it. When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves, and so God, God killed an animal and took the skins off that animal and placed those blood-soaked skins on Adam and Eve. And that's when the Bible says they were covered. It says they were clothed. 
from that point on, God said there's going to be the spilling. The spilling of blood is a part of worship. So if you want to worship me and you want to connect with me, you're going to need to spill some blood. I see a lot of times in our, our, our modern uh, kind of mindset, we think that's, you know, that, that's gross and that, that, that's horrible. There's something to this. There's a reason for all of this. See, I've said this before, but if you think about it, in the book of Genesis, God killed an animal spilled its blood, took its skins, clothed Adam and Eve. And then we fast forward to the cross where Jesus was, the Lamb of God, was crucified once and for all, and His blood was shed. If you think about it, God made the first and the last sacrifice for mankind. And so all through the Old Testament, we see, we see this. So what's happening in Hebrews when it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ... So the reason why he says that is because right before that, he's talking about how the blood of the animals in worship, when that blood was spilled, he was saying that blood and those animals had the power to actually atone for man's sin. Now, here's what that word atone means. Great picture of it is you got a stain on the wall, and you can't get the stain off the wall, so you just paint over it. And so basically God is saying that the blood of animals has this much power. The blood of animals, if you'll worship me by spilling the blood of these sheep, these oxen, uh, whatever that might be, whatever animal that might be, he said that blood has the power to atone for your sin. In other words, it will cover your sin so you can move on from that sin. But it just covers it. And so what the writer here in Hebrews is saying, if the blood of animals in, God, in worship to God spilled out in worship to God, has the power to atone or cover our sin so we can at least move beyond our sin, how much more will the blood of Christ, who blood He offered through the power of the eternal Spirit, offered Himself up to God, cleanse or purge your conscience from dead works? In other words, the blood of animals just covered sin. The blood of Christ annihilates sin. The blood of animals just allows us to move on from our sin, but the blood of Christ literally changes us and sets us free from sin. It's much more powerful. See, the book of Leviticus says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Why is the blood of Jesus so powerful? Because the blood of Jesus represents the life of Jesus. The blood of a bull or an oxen or a sheep represents the life of a dumb old animal. But the blood of Jesus represents the life of Jesus, a life that was perfect. The blood of Jesus represents a life of perfect obedience. It represents a life that never submitted itself to sin. It represents a life that was completely victorious over temptation. It represents a life that was completely obedient to God and submissive to His will. It represents a life that never experienced sickness or disease. It represents a life that was never, never conquered by sin or by the devil. It represents a life that defeated the powers of death by raising himself from the dead. It represents that. That's why his blood's so powerful, see? And the blood of Jesus didn't come from Joseph. The blood of Jesus is sacred because it came from the throne of God. Mary didn't get pregnant because she had sex with Joseph. Mary had life, the life of Christ within her because according to the angel Gabriel, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. The seed of God was planted in her. And the daddy always determines the blood type. And Joseph was not Jesus' father. The heavenly father was. Does this make sense? The blood that flowed through Jesus' veins came straight from the loins of God. It was sacred and powerful and eternal, see? And that's why the writer says, how much more shall the blood of Christ? Man, the blood of animals had the ability to do this, but the blood of Jesus goes much further than this. Matter of fact, the very first thing that we see is that the blood of Jesus gives our lives significance. So look at, look at that uh, verse 14 in Hebrews 9 again. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, which means he was completely innocent. But who through what? Did I catch you off guard? Who through what? Who through the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit. And, and it was through the work, and listen, it was through the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus offered up his life and spilled his blood. And here's what we see in the New Testament. 
we see that the Holy Spirit and the blood are inseparable. The matter of fact, Jesus said it this way, unless I go, he can't come and won't come. And the he that he's referring to is the Holy Spirit, right? And Jesus said, I have to go for him to come. And that word go represents, the, under the umbrella of that word go, is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. His crucifixion. The brokenness of his body, the spilling of his blood. In other words, Jesus' blood had to be spilt first before the Holy Spirit could come in his fullness. If Jesus didn't spill his blood, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. Does this make sense, everybody? So you see the power of the Holy Spirit is always in connection with the power of the blood of Jesus. So just as the blood of Jesus and its power is working in our lives, it's working in our lives through the ministry and power of the Holy Spirit. And so it gives our lives substance, significance. Now let me illustrate it this way. In the Old Testament, we see this connection between the blood and the Spirit, but we see even more so the, 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 the completeness that it brings to our lives. So uh, one example, and there's several of them, but this is just one, where the, uh, Solomon has built the temple in all of its glory, and all of its majesty, and the ark is being brought in, and now they're going to dedicate the ark. They're going to worship God uh, and, 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 and celebrate the ark being placed back into the new temple. And so in Second Chronicles chapter 5, it says, And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him before the ark were sacrificing sheep, oxen, that, that could not be counted or numbered for the multitude. And so here's what's happening. The ark's being brought. Now they're going to worship God. They realize there's got to be the spilling of blood. And so what we see here is we see this dramatic scene where we see them uh, sacrificing sheep and oxen. How many? They couldn't count. There were so many sheep and oxen that they lost count. Now how many would agree with me? That's probably a lot of blood flowing in this worship before God. And as the blood of these sheep and oxen began to spill out, there was hundreds, thousands of the sheep and oxen that were being slaughtered. And as that blood was being spilled out, notice if we drop down here a little bit further in, in this same chapter in verse 13, and it says, And it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments, and they praised the Lord, saying, He is good, His mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with the cloud, with a cloud, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. And so what it's talking about when it says the cloud or the glory of the Lord, it's referring to the presence of God. It's referring to the Spirit of God. And so here's what happened. The blood flows, the Spirit comes. Jesus, His blood flowed, and His Spirit has come. But here's why the blood of Jesus that was offered through the power of the Holy Spirit gives our life significance. Here's why I say that. Because in this passage of Scripture, the Holy Spirit, the glory of God, the presence of God was so strong, the priests couldn't even stand to minister. They couldn't even stand up to minister and do their duty as priests because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Why couldn't they stand? Because of the weight of the presence of God. See, the word glory, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but I want to insert this in the context of our, our time this morning. The word glory is the Hebrew word kabod, and it's translated weight or substance or weightiness. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, has a, even though you can't necessarily see it, it has a weight to it. It has a substance to it. It has a significance to it. It completes us. It covers us. We feel it. We sense it. We understand it. It's tangible to us, even though we can't necessarily feel it with our hands. It's tangible, see, because Adam and Eve, when they lost it, they hid themselves. And so this weight, this substance, the glory of God fills the house of God and it's so heavy that the priest can't stand up underneath it. What I'm trying to say is, is that the blood of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit brings a sense of weightiness, a completeness, a, a significance, a substance to our lives. We don't have to walk around like Adam and Eve feeling like we're naked. We can feel covered by the presence, 
carried by the presence, sustained by the presence of God, by the Spirit of God, by the power of His blood. It gives our life, it gives, it adds weight to our lives, see? And so that's why oftentimes I'll say, many of you wonder what's missing in my life. It's not what, it's who. Well, something's missing, yes, but it's not something, it's someone that gives your life a sense of completeness. And like Adam and Eve, we try to cover ourselves and we try to substitute for that. We, we, we run around and try to figure all that out and we come up empty-handed and we know we're still lacking and still wanting. We're not quite sure what it is and then somebody introduces us to Jesus. We realize, wait a minute, and then even as Christians, a lot of time we have, what they, they, what they, we have access to the power and the presence of God, but we still find ourselves running after other stuff, trying to fill our lives up. Folks, there's nothing that will satisfy but God's presence. Presence. It's the power of His blood that brings the weight of His Spirit to our lives and completes us. Amen? Does that make sense? Now, I know Tom Cruise told Renee Zellweger that she completed him. I can't remember the name of that movie. Don't, don't watch it. But, and Bonnie and I, you know, we've been married a long time, longer than most of you have been alive. But ultimately, she doesn't complete me. That sounds romantic. Honey, you complete me. Wow, that's just like a movie. But ultimately, she doesn't complete me. And ultimately, I don't complete her. Right? I know some of you are processing that right now. It doesn't seem romantic to you. She's like, well, you're killing us here. I, I, I've got that tattooed on my forearm. He completes me. You're going to have to change that tattoo, get it redone or something. But if I complete her and I go home to the go home to be with the Lord before her, then now what? If she completes me and now I need her to complete me, and she goes home to be with the Lord before I do, now what? No, she adds to my life and I add to her life. And and we've been married 38 years and I we love it. I mean, it's great, it's powerful. But I'm telling you, ultimately, Bonnie doesn't complete me, and ultimately, I don't complete her. Jesus completes us. His spirit completes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You're complete. You're, if you're single, you can be complete. Yeah. I can tell I need to move on. All right, I'm going to move on. I was doing real good there, and then I... I know some of you are like, Pastor, you're doing real good until that last part. All right. But the other thing is, is that the blood of Jesus provides intimacy. The blood of Jesus not only uh, brings significance or weight, weightiness or completeness to us through the Spirit, but the blood of Jesus provides intimacy. And here's why I say this, because you can't be any more intimate with a person beyond your, la your latest and last secret. You can't be any more intimate with another person beyond or past your last secret. And so there's a lot of times we as Christians really struggle with this idea of being intimate with the Lord, being even being comfortable in His presence. We Sometimes in a setting like this, we'll sense the presence of God. And, and, and a lot of times, folks, they get uncomfortable with that. Not that they don't like it, but they get uncomfortable. It feels awkward because they're... They're, they're so conscious and aware of their sin, even sin that they've committed, even sin that they've asked for forgiveness for, sin that they've repented for. I'm talking about past stuff. And we get in the presence of God and we feel awkward, we feel uncomfortable because we're more conscious and aware of our past sins than we are aware and conscious of Jesus and His grace and the power of His blood. And it, and it interrupts that ability that we have to be intimate with the Lord. Does that make sense? It's true. It happens all the time. You know, we have difficulty privately. We get in there, we start to pray, we start feeling, we start sensing God's presence, and then we, it starts feeling awkward and we get uncomfortable with it. And many times the reason why is because we're still, we're, we're like, I don't deserve to be here. I don't. All of a sudden, you know what we are? We're like Adam and Eve. We want to run and hide when God's presence shows up, just like they did. Well, they ran and hide because they were aware of their sin more than they were aware of God. And we do the same thing. And I'm, I'm talking about stuff that we've even, for, we've even asked forgiveness for, we've even repented for. But the enemy, the devil, you know how he is. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. 
That's a fancy way of saying that he accuses us and reminds us of our past all the time. And here's when he, and he really, he really ratches it up. He really ramps it up when we start getting really close and we start really pressing in, and we're going to church more consistently, we're starting to read our Bible, we're starting to pray, right? You following what I'm saying? We're letting God use us a little bit. So we're kind of drawing closer to the Lord, and that's when the enemy oftentimes will ramp up this, this dialogue, this narrative, and he'll ramp it up and slip alongside of us and start reminding us of what we've done. And we start feeling shamed again and guilty about it. And all he, the reason why is because he saw you getting close, and he realizes the closer you get to Jesus, the more like him you're going to be. And so he just wants to interrupt that process by reminding you of your past. That's why the Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. But it, here's, what, here's what this scripture is telling us. That the blood of Jesus, let's go back to Hebrews 9. The blood of Jesus who the eternal spirit offered himself without spot. Watch this. Cleanses your conscience from dead works. See, the blood of Bulls and oxen and sheep, they just atoned or covered up so a person could move on. But the blood of Jesus has the power to go much deeper than the stain of sin. No matter how deep the stain of sin may be, the blood of Jesus goes deeper. And it purges our conscience so that we're more aware of Him than we are of our past. So when the accuser tries to accuse us, we know we have a lawyer, we have an advocate, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the blood of Jesus that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel speaks cries out for vengeance. The blood of Jesus cries out mercy. So when he accuses us, we just step back and let the blood of Jesus speak for us. We let the Holy Spirit speak for us. And he defends us and says, no, he's not guilty. He's been set free. Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? He's been found innocent. And I'm telling you, that's the amazing thing about the gospel is that we can, that we, we, we're found innocent. And we're like, well, wait a minute, I'm not innocent. I did it. I know you did. But that was paid for. So you don't have to pay for it. That debt's been settled. Right? Don't, when you pay a debt, isn't that what happened? It's settled. You don't pay off something and then have them call you again and say, hey, you owe us something. What do you mean? I don't, I don't owe you anything. If you paid off something on your credit card or paid off your furniture or paid off a car or whatever, and you've got that great feeling, you've got the title in your hand, and then the, the, the people that held the title call you up and say, hey, you're late on a payment. <laughs> really? I have the title right here. I'm looking at it. I can fax it to you if you'd like. Well, you need to pay it. I'm not paying you anything. Well, you, I don't owe you a thing. Why? I paid it off. Stop it. Leave me alone. What are you talking about? Right? Isn't that how we'd respond? We'd be, we'd be bold. We'd be so bold. We'd be bold all over. But hey, call me again. We're going to take, you're not going to take the car. I've got the title. Click. What are you going to do? Are you following this? Our sin, Jesus paid for. It has been paid. The debt has been settled. The devil calls you up and tries to intimidate you and says, you still owe. We got to realize I got a title right here by the blood of Jesus says, I am free from that. That debt's been paid. You just need to shut the noise. Hang up. Well, I'm going to repossess. You're not going to repossess anything. You don't owe anything. You're bold like crazy, right? That's why in Hebrews 10, 19 says, We now therefore have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. Nothing's dragged. We're not dragging anything behind us. Amen. Does that make sense? Is that, and that's where it, that's really like, isn't that the first step to being able to be intimate with the Lord, right? Knowing that we don't have to, we don't have to deal with this. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us. Here's the last and final thing, is that the blood of Jesus, we see here in Hebrews 9, is eternal. Through who? Through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot. Who? Through the eternal spirit. You know what that tells us? That tells us that the blood of Jesus, see, it's so powerful, right, folks? It, it, it cleanses us. It purges our conscience. Jesus paid for your sin. Folks, listen to me. But here's what a lot of people don't realize. The most shameful thing for a Jew was to experience the death penalty and to hang on a cross. It was shameful. The 
Bible tells us in the same book of Hebrews that Jesus carried our sin despising its shame. In other words, there was shame. In other words, Jesus didn't just carry your sin. He carried your shame. So you don't have to be ashamed. Didn't you do that? Yeah, I did that. Don't you feel ashamed? No. Do I think it was wrong? Absolutely. Would I do it again? No. Was it horrible? You bet. Do I walk around feeling shameful and guilty about it? No. Why? Because if the blood of animals could cover it, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God without spot, purge my conscience from dead works to empower me to serve a living God? I don't have to be ashamed. Does this make sense, everybody? See what I'm saying? And there's no expiration date on it. It's eternal. So the blood of Jesus is just as powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago. There's no expiration date on it. And I hate expiration dates. Hate them. Especially on milk. Hate them. Right? I'm obsessed by this. I'm obsessed by it. I'm constantly looking at it. Bonnie will tell you, honey, smell this. I'm here the milk. I smell the milk. I don't, I don't want to smell No, smell it. Tell me if it's okay. You can smell it. Look at the size of my nose. I can smell anything. As big as my nose is, I can wake up. I wake up in the morning to the smell of coffee in Brazil. I, I, that's how big my nose is. Just, I lay on my back. It looks like a two-car garage. It's, just, it's huge. I turn sideways. You've got to use a wide-angle lens. It, it, I've got a big nose. I can smell the milk. But I'm really I'm, I'm, I'm hyper about it. I'm, I'm just like weird about it. I, there's, but look at the date, honey. It, it, it expires tomorrow. Or to, uh, the worst is today, right? You want to have a bowl of cereal, you pull the thing out. Oh, it's today. And I think what happened was is I had a bad experience. About 10 years ago, I, 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 you know, took my first spoonful. The milk was sour. It, yeah, it, it was traumatic. I, 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 through several months of counseling. No, I'm just kidding. It's horrible. Because you're always wondering, is it, is, it, is it still good? Is it, honey, you think it's going to work? Is this okay? It's not just milk. It's anything that has expiration. I'm always asking her, you think it's okay? It's all right. Oh, it smells funny. I'm so glad I don't have to think about that and wonder about that, about the blood of Jesus. Is it still good? Does it still work? It's still good, and it still works, and it'll always work. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, I'm so thankful. And I, our prayer especially those of us that might be here and we've had difficulty really enjoying that intimacy with you, enjoying your presence because we're, we're, we've still been convinced by the enemy to drag this stuff behind us. The very stuff that you've forgiven, that you've paid for, that your blood has cleansed us from. And so, Father, may we open up our hearts right now to the power of your blood to cleanse us to purge our conscience so that we're no longer conscious of our sin but we're only aware of your sacrifice of your forgiveness of your grace of your mercy the blood of Jesus that washes over us not just one day or one time but every day every moment of every day when we're awake and while we're asleep your blood constantly flows over our lives cleansing us from all sin from all shame from all guilt may we open up our heart fully to that in jesus name amen can we thank god for his word man you guys did good thank you